ICA presents Hello and welcome to the Ask Us Anything podcast brought to you by the International Communication Association. My name is Mary Beth Oliver. I'm the current president of the ICA and a professor of media studies at Penn State University. This is the first installment of Ask Us Anything where we talk about issues that face us as academics, as students, as scholars, and as mentors. For our first episode, I've invited four guest speakers to join me in discussing our first topic, networking. So now we'll briefly introduce ourselves. Hello, um, my name is Ariane Fascio. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Communication at Florida State. So still early career, but I've been a member of ICA since 2014. So. I've met lots of people and have done my share of networking, so excited to be here. Hi, uh, my name is Minji Lee. I am an assistant professor from the University of Tampa. Uh, I research multicultural advertising, brand activism, and uh, media diversity. And uh, I am an early career, uh, like Orion, I'm an early career um, junior professor, you know, also done my share of networking. You know, there are good story and bad story. Just wanted to be here to share that with uh, everyone here. Hope it's helpful. I want to get back to that bad story one too, because <laughs> these are the kind of things that we need to share. Oh, I have tons. I have okay, tons. okay. I'm Angela Valdivia. I'm sorry. I am a research no. professor at the Institute of Communications Research at the That's University of Illinois. I am also the chair of the Department of Latina Latino Studies. I have a long time engagement with ICA since I was a grad student, and I have try to network. So hopefully I have some helpful things to say. Hi everyone, I am Jess Petrowski. I am an associate professor at the University of Amsterdam. So I'm part of the Amsterdam School of Communication Research. Um, I am the director of the Graduate School for Communication here. And I'm also um, the director of the Center for Research on Children, Adolescents, and the Media. And it's my research on kids and media that I'm most connected to with ICA. I was a former chair of the CAM division of ICA. Um, and I have been around ICA for, I was trying to do the count, I can't even tell how many years now. So from my very, very early days of graduate school years ago, I was involved with that and I've sort of worked my way through. So I think I'm probably called mid-career by some now, but I like to hold on to my youth. So I'm going to get the ball rolling, but otherwise we're looking for our panelists to, uh, to ask us the question. So, but I'll start um first and one thing is i'm not even really sure what networking is <laughs> i mean i'll be honest with you like what does that word mean but even within this broad sort of understanding of connections between um academics in this case what are some ways that that it's influenced your career if it has you know i'll just go ahead and start with me is that um it it actually forged the way for collaborations in ways that I had no idea would be possible when I was in grad school. It wasn't really something that was discussed. And then one, one networking and uh, with a, a dear friend and collaborator named Ann Barsh, um, that one thing spread to other connections and she's in Germany, within Germany, you know, and it just spread out from there, and those were really turned into working, you know, collaborations on projects where we we produced papers and, and research together. <clears throat> and that has been invaluable because not only is it like a good friend, but it's a really productive thing too. Sometimes you just have a really nice person to see at your next conference and it's nice for that too. But so people who are newer to ICA may not know that the Children, Adolescents and Media Division was not always around. And when I was pursuing my PhD at the time, one of my mentors was Amy Jordan. Those of you might know our former ICA president. Um, and Amy is still my person in this world. And I was completely nervous when she invited me to go to the first conference in Boston. I had absolutely no idea what a conference was. I also bought an overpriced suit thinking that's what you did. <laughs> and I remember going and Cam didn't exist yet. And she said to me, who do you want to meet? And I remember that question thinking, I can meet someone here? She's like, who do you want to meet? And I had just finished reading an article by Patty Valkenberg. And I thought, and she says, I said, will you be there? Will Professor Valkenberg be there? She says, oh, absolutely. And when we went to Boston, 
she introduced me to Patsy. And I, at the time I was like shaking like a leaf and my hands were sweaty. And I was so nervous to meet this person who had been reading all of this work. And, and not all things lead to jobs and research collaborations. And then the Patsy said to me, I, you know, I'm thinking that we should put a proposal together to make CAM a division. Would you be interested to talk about this? Mm -hmm. I thought, oh my gosh, this is like this amazing scholar talking to me and actually valuing my thoughts as a junior scholar. Mm -hmm. Long time, like as it goes around, I help with the proposal. Eventually ICA approves it at a, a division. We got to know Patty more and more. And at some point, Ask her had a position open here and she contacted me and said, you should apply. I don't think all networking leads to such a beautiful serendipitous moment. Mm -hmm. Many also have just given me a buddy in the coffee line at ICA as well. But it takes one person to see me and just say, who would you like to meet? And that's what networking was for me. That's a great story. I mean, think about who you want to meet and make that happen. And that's like what I believe, like the pay it forward motion of the beauty of academia is being able to say, let's go to a reception and let me introduce you to this person. And I think that that starting point is one of the most powerful things we do at ac in academic network. That's great. You know, I have a story similar, I would say. This networking didn't happen at ICA per se, but it happened regardless. And I still consider a networking opportunity. Um, and so uh, my advisor happens to be Mary Beth. Um, and while I was in graduate school, she was working on this pretty sizable grant um, from the Templeton Foundation with Art Rainey, um, who is now my coworker, colleague at Florida State. And I got the opportunity to meet him and we had lunch with him. And it was kind of, you know, just an opportunity to meet and chat with someone um, who I had heard lots about, but had never at that point met. Those kinds of, of things can happen um, where if you, if you meet people, get to know them and not just get to know them, but also have them getting to know kind of your work Another thing to think about when you're on the job market is like, would somebody like to have you as a colleague, et cetera, et cetera. I think that all of that goes a long way. I know when, when I was on the market, it was just like every little bit helps, <laughs> you know? Um, and then also, you know, you do have those smaller moments where I've met people at conferences. And then, you know, my very first conference was ICA in Seattle in 2014. And I met a bunch of people. We got on a boat and went to like this small island off Seattle um, with a bunch of people I had just met. And like those people are still people that every time I'm at a conference, I, you know, I hit them up. And even though I might not have collaborated with them or don't work with them, you know, it's kind of that interpersonal connection. And then the last thing I will also say is that networking when you are on the tenure track is hugely important for going up for tenure because people have to write letters for you. I mean, you're not allowed to ask them, hey, could, you know, would you write a letter for me? But if they know who you are and know the kind of work you've done, I mean, I think the chances that they will write you a letter and a, a positive one at that is a lot higher. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I would say that that's probably very true in the American context, mm -hmm. but I think it's more generally knowing the academic space you're in and knowing where your networking helps you in all of your different spaces. Gotcha. So for example, I find it also just as helpful when I'm trying to develop a new course and I can ask a bunch of people who teach something similar and say, um, has anybody else figured out how to do this assignment? Or when I'm gonna be going to another country because I've been invited to speak for a day and I think, oh, is there a buddy there where I could hang out for two or three days. So I think there's all different ways that it helps you. If you're in university, if you stay in that space after you're finished your PhD and you're in there, mm -hmm. what networking looks like is also, I think, very culturally relevant and how you use it is very much culturally dependent. So Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And also, you know, I think those connections that you are making appearance, you are making yourself known. And yes, you might not get a job, you might feel frustrated, but you you plan to see in people's heads. And sometimes those connections, it might blossom in in various ways that you don't know, right? Also, for, as a junior faculty member, I think uh, networking is very important in terms of building good external reports to help you navigate tenure and promotion experiences. That being said, I really think when you approach networking, it's not just climbing the ladder, you know, get to know famous and senior people, but also get to know people of your ranks. You have shared these experiences. Do not have this like scarcity mentality that you are competing against each other. You help each other in the, in the process and also uplift each other. I think that's important. That's why, you know, networking um, means to me as a um, junior faculty member. I'm going to talk about networking from being a senior faculty member 
And uh, right now my goal in networking is to introduce diverse junior scholars to the field because the field remains so incredibly white and they still, the field still references primarily white people. The field still places people in positions of authority and power that are normative culture people. And so I am trying to diversify the professoriate. That has been my goal all along. And so when I go to a conference, I want to make sure that all of my students are being introduced around to each other and to people in the field. When people ask me for panel participants, I'm trying to network my diverse scholars, whether they be my same rank, whether they be associate professors, whether they be assistant professors or whether they be upcoming graduate students. I am always flabbergasted the kind of underrepresentation that still continues to pervade our field. And so I do want to introduce my students and their incredible work. I, uh, in terms of, you know, every single division in the field. And I always tell, especially junior scholars, that when you're networking, you have to assume that everybody you meet is a full professor and treat them with that respect. Because what happens is, again, the racialized politics, not just of our field, is that when people see a person of color, they assume they're a graduate student and they treat them as such and they address them as such. And so I teach my, my mentees, treat everybody like a full professor. Nobody's gonna get upset if you mistake a graduate student for a full professor but a full professor will get upset if you think you're a grad student. And that still happens to me. People still treat me and think, oh, are you a grad student? Just because you're Latina, I guess you're stuck in the grad student category. So that's like a tip, but also my mission is to diversify the professoriate and I, keep, I do my networking towards that goal. I appreciate that so much. And I'm actually curious from the attendees in the group, how other attendees maybe define networking. Because I hear a couple different examples of networking. And one thing I didn't hear yet is also the networking we do if you're doing research, if you are a researcher, not only within the academy, but networking outside of the academy too. So for example, I find that as a scholar myself, I'm trying to understand how the youth media space is influencing young people. But the scholars I'm working with are not the ones creating the youth media space, right? It's the companies, it's products, it's organizations. And actually, so part of my networking is also outside of that, also to share what we're learning from science, to think of um, really how I can validate or valorize my scholarship, but also to learn from it. So I see that as networking too. But I'm wondering if anybody else has ideas on how they define networking and all these different examples. Yeah, so that's a, it's a good question, how to define it. Um, yeah. But I, 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 wanna, I wanna get back also to something Minji you said and I think I, lo I love this point and it was about lateral networking you know and we always see it as like oh I want to meet that person or this person mm -hmm. and that's not necessarily I mean that's great but there are a lot of really younger people who are at your same career who are eager and energetic and also interested in reaching out. Here's another question. So COVID has made life difficult in terms of networking for sure. But when you're thinking about, you know, you're at a conference, if you're by yourself, you know, and your advisor isn't there, somebody's not there, how do you go up to people? You, how do you meet them? Yeah, it's tough. I think the first, the going up to people is difficult. And also, I think for those of us who are more senior members, remembering that it's difficult for people on the other side, I think is, is a big point. Um, one thing I've done is a lot of divisions now at ICA have receptions. And well, they all have a reception of some sort, but more and more of them have made it a point to say, have done so. For example, um, Nancy Jennings, I think she's in the, the to one of our attendees today. Um, in in her role at CAMP, she's really been facilitating, facilitating these mentorship and research escalator sessions where you're paired with sort of a senior scholar mm -hmm. and get to talk with them. And any of those opportunities where you can begin taking advantage of a lot of the opportunities that ICA has started to do. I think we had like a ICA mentor, ICA hashtag going on on Twitter where we were taking individual meetings, just like anybody who wanted to chat. Um, I know a lot of the divisions now at the receptions, they come up to people and they make it a point and they even build in some sort of mentorship escalator sessions. Um, and then the blue sky sessions, I think, are one of the most underutilized but awesome spaces we have because everybody with a shared interest is at a table and it's small. And it breaks down that first going up to someone because everybody is bringing something to it. So we often miss the blue skies because they're not in our division, 
right? Mm -hmm. But if you're interested in something and you're like, oh, I want to talk with people, there's a range of people at the table and all of those spaces. So looking for mentorship opportunities in your division, mm -hmm. going to some of the smaller things that are offered by ICA that we often miss, um, I think are two really key areas to do it as well. And I think I would also add um, that sometimes it's nice to meet people kind of divorced from the conference in a way. But if you can, or even if you can't, you know, finding sort of those spaces that are outside this sort of mm -hmm. formal um, workspace, if you will, where it's a little bit more relaxing is always nice. And the people in your panel can be a good place to start because if the panel is put together well or or it works out properly, you know, you never know how the panels exactly will go. But, um, you know, it's going to be people that on some level have some some shared interests research wise and and the worst they could do is say no so um, we're thinking of course of ICA there's lots of other spaces but I noticed that a lot of my students often think that a poster presentation is a bad thing mm. like oh no I'm like no 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 posters are so awesome I'm super I love posters I'm actually a general introvert and I perform extroversion and like sometimes all of the big receptions and things I kind of want to go hide but at the poster it's sort of one person at a time coming and talking to you and it's somebody who was interested in what you were doing and so don't necessarily look down at some of these I think sometimes we have a misinterpretation of how great they can be so I think that's another space too yeah yeah I completely agree with what Orion and Jessica just say you know the poster session and also like for the children media they have the escalation you know the the, the, the mentor mentee pairing right speed dating kind of thing right <laughs> so I think those are those are really great create this like, intimate you know like interaction the one-on-one -on -one interaction that you don't have in the traditional panel so just take advantage of those mentorship program that ICA and also different formats that ICA provide because I think ICA is one of those conferences really really strive to uh, create opportunities to cross the gap, right? So take advantage of those those opportunity. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, just just know, you know, why you are there. Alyssa, she mentioned like emailing people after their session. Emailing people is, I think, like if I get an email from someone that like wants to talk more about my work or whatever, I get excited because one, it's usually a little bit after the the conference, so you're like, oh, that's nice, you know. But also, it, it gives you a space where you might feel a little bit more comfortable as well. So I think that that's a good point. We had a question um, from a, from um, one of the attendees, and this is from Rebecca Wald. How do you avoid feeling like that? I'm not good. I'm not being good enough. So do you know of strategies that might draw a good mental line to not trigger self-doubt or develop a mm -hmm. distorted perception of work-life balance? For me, so... The most intimidating thing in the world is walking around a conference with Mary Beth Oliver um, because she's famous. Everybody knows her. And I'm just like walking around with her and I don't know anybody. And they're all like talking to her completely like ignoring my existence, which the first few times I'm like terrified. Right. So it's like I don't know anyone. I was a brand new grad student and Mary Beth does a great job of introducing you to people. So um it it's super intimidating right so it's like you don't know anyone you're a brand new student my first ICA I was a master's student in fact um and I'm like oh my gosh like I don't know anybody I, I, I'm like a garbage researcher I don't you know and so you're like very intimidated and honestly for me the only thing that helped was practice I am Sort of an extroverted introvert so i i like meeting people but i also really like being by myself and so like forcing myself to not do that like my, my natural inclination when i go places is to like hang out in my hotel um which will get you nowhere as it happens so um making myself be in those spaces even though it's uncomfortable um and then after a while you do start to meet those people and then once you meet a few people it sort of snowballs, you meet more and you meet more. And like nowadays, I mean, I feel totally fine and comfortable um, walking around conferences with Mary Beth. Maybe other people have better strategies, but for me, literally the only thing was forcing myself to be in those uncomfortable spaces mm -hmm. and just practicing was kind of the only way for me to get over that. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that point is very important, you know, uh, showing up and, you know, occupy, take out a space, particularly if you're from, 
uh, marginal, marginalized uh, community, like race, gender, sexuality, it's very important. You know, it's, sometimes you're going to feel very uncomfortable. You don't see people like you on the tables. But the thing is, that it's very, very important for you to uh, make yourself known, you know, to get used to. I think that's the way for you to uh, accumulate confidence, right? And also just knowing that networking, it's not just a one time thing. If you, you don't feel comfortable the first time, and if you're showing up often enough, people will know you, right? If you're showing up enough, people in that field, in that space, we know you, right? So I think I, you know, I think one thing is to not think about, you know, um, networking is, is this one-time thing, you know, be confident and showing up. And and over time, um, the there will be solution down the road. I literally just give a lecture on that. It's just one of my unfavorite things because I, I really think it's a very unhelpful concept. We all belong here. We all earned our place here. And to step into a subjectivity of imposter syndrome, is, it is, an, it's an invitation to step into subjectivity that we really should not accept. That is just not an invitation any of us need to accept. All of us belong here. And anybody that brings that up, it's really not a helpful person to network with because we should be helping each other by first of all telling each other we belong here we have every right to be here we're here because we belong here and we deserve to be here we did our work we all belong here we've gone through very very stringent processes to get here and so i really recommend to all of my <laughs> mentees and people that I network with, the first thing I say is like, here we are, we belong here. Let's hit the ground. You know what I mean? And I would say I have two things. One, um, I was hearing Ariana's story and I was thinking to myself, for the senior scholars who are joining us today, we should do better. And this is not a criticism to any one of us, it's to all of us, right? Because sometimes when we are in, we're talking about the conference because all of us are ICA members. So that's our joint identity in this particular space right now. But I hear you say that, and I'm sure that I've done that. I'm sure I've walked up and saw Mary Beth and talked directly to her and didn't actually see the person next to you. And it was because we were running in between and I could justify it a hundred times over, but it was wrong. Actually, that, that's, where, that's where I am in that space. Like that's how I feel. And I think that all of us who are senior here too, when we hopefully get to see us together in human forms again some days, maybe one of the things we can try remembering is how much we lost over the past year and a half and missing that and take two more seconds to say, and this is my student who's with me right now. Just because we open those dialogues, if nothing more to acknowledge our own humanity and next to each other. So one, I personally will do better on that. And I think anybody else who's joining, that's something we can all work on. I'm 100% certain I've been the person that did that wrong and I can do better. And so I think honesty in these sorts of spaces where we say that helps a ton to help us maximize the, the hallway conversation. Starbucks lines are very powerful for networking. Yeah. So um, what can you do when your mentors aren't, aren't from com science or are in com? Um, how do you make it happen a bit more on your own? Proactivity, forcing yourself into uncomfortable spaces, like Ariane said. Yeah, I, I think it's possible. You know, here's, Marm, that's such a great question. And we've been kind of talking about it like you have to go up to a person. But, you know, honestly, I would say that getting in, involved on committees is a huge one. I think there, there are so many activities that are non-ICA or non-conference related. If your program is having some sort of, of, of job search, go to those job talks. If you have invited uh, scholars, go to those. You know, oftentimes, I know in my program we're looking to, uh, you know, have have graduate students come to dinner with the speakers and stuff like that, and that's like a huge way. And so even if they don't get the job, they're going to get a job somewhere else, and you'll see them there. So taking advantage of 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 every every opportunity. Yes. that you can is I think pay attention huge. in your home universities I, you know the number of times we host scholars that come out here and they come out and we host them and we say we're going to have them available all day for uh, 15 minute coffee hours you can join them and talk and so many people in our in my own computer community our, our, our graduate students think oh I don't have enough to ask about I don't have something big enough to talk about I don't warrant this person's time you do you should please join the human experience is learning from each other and learning who we are. Um, so the small things in your home departments can be a great space. Um, and bigger than that, 
I have been at working at ICA and served as an officer in so many different ways for so many years. And the one thing I know to be true is that I've never worked with an officer who did not care about this conference and its people. I wanted to acknowledge a couple of things. Um, one, um, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, but uh, Rosia um, was talking about um, links for people from low income families or countries. You know, if you could please email me and we can talk about your situation. I think that's a really important one. And Kirsty asked what about uh, attendees who don't feel confident communicating in English. And I, I just have to say, um, do I, I personally am feel, and I think I represent ICA's membership, don't worry mm -hmm. about that at all, because that's part of being an international conference. We want to celebrate and, and, and really in, encourage people from communities where English isn't the native language. And one last thing, I'm gonna make a commitment. This is based on what Je Jess was saying, I can do better. And I've been trying to do this, and maybe you can say something that you, you are gonna try to do. I, and this is my, my goal, it is like, if somebody's talking to me, I see you. So that's a, a commitment. I mean, sure, there are times when you are rushing off to a panel and you have to say, I would love to stay here. But I think we owe each other, you know, the dignity of, of, of really hearing and looking at a person when they come up to, and they want to network. So that's my promise. Any other promises? <laughs> my promise is whoever I'm standing with, whenever I'm, I, I'm bringing some of my new PhD students this year to ICA, I will make sure that you are not forgotten when I'm standing there talking to someone else too, because I, I, I like for me, I realize this is supposed to be supporting to everyone else, but I take this away so seriously. Like I find this such a powerful statement that these things matter so much and it's easy to forget and I'm going to do better. I think for me, um, I see like people like Mary Beth and other people that I've met modeling great behavior that I mm -hmm. want to emulate, like, um, trying to help out graduate students whenever possible, you know, even if it, if, even if it's just taking them to dinner so that they can afford to eat because conferences are really expensive. Your university may or may not have money to support you. And I mean, that's not a great mental space to be in. Um, so even if it's something simple, like buying them coffee or buying them dinner, but also, um, not leaving them on an island when I'm at a conference. So I think now that I am in a position where I am a faculty member, even though I'm still junior, uh, I'm certainly more senior than a graduate student um, and, and remembering what it was like to be a graduate student and, and helping them to network because it can be really tough when you're, when you're there by yourself. Especially our COVID PhDs. Yeah, so they might not have never Gosh, been we all able to, to go. Yeah, you know? especially that group. All right, this is so, we could go on forever, and I, I don't know. I've got all warm fuzzies here talking mm -hmm. to you, and I, this is really enriching. And uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks to all of you, and um, yeah, I look forward to, to to taking up new issues as we go along with the series. So, thanks all, and. Have a good week. <laughs> Ask Us Anything is a production of the International Communication Association Podcast Network. Our producer is Maria Camanillo. Our production coordinator is Nick Song. Our executive producer is Aldo Diaz Caballero. The theme music is by Vladimir Podobnik. Please check the show notes in the episode description to learn more about me, my guests, and the ICA. Thanks for listening.